give it to you. Okay? <laughs> this is uh, <clears throat> this is a booklet called "The Day Will Come," and it has brief bios on about 60 or 70 people who are buried alongside the martyrs. So they're either people buried or, like Joe Hill, have his ashes scattered uh, at the um, at the monument. Uh, in the center of the book is a, uh, uh, it, it serves as a walking tour of what we all call Radical Row. It used to be called the Communist Plot. <laughs> <laughs> sort, of, sort of an inside joke. Um, but what I want to say is that this is an extremely important cemetery. There are some folks who were very, very wealthy, but um, there are lots of extremely unique things that, that you'll find in the cemetery. And one, and one is, and I'll just mention briefly, right, you are standing in the center of a group of probably 80 gypsies or Roma um, people, most of whom were from the Chicago area. So what we can do now, I, I, I have a prejudice. I know. And, and that is that as we're walking down to the martyrs, and it's just a short walk, there's one gypsy grave that I'd like you to see. So let's just head down here, just a little bit straight, and then we'll angle off, of course, to the left uh, for the martyrs. <laughs> of course. So Mark, I'm... Uh, on the bus here, I was telling the story, and we're all going to just head down this way, and I, hopefully you could uh, stay warm enough, and uh, uh, we'll be there in a moment, share a little celebration. We're celebrating. You know, labor history, they are, we're always celebrating massacres and deaths, but hey, this cemetery is so different because these kind of people that are here that we're coming to celebrate, They'd love you dancing on their grave. Almost all of them. They're not into this. Oh, don't step. You know they. These people. And I mean, you would know this if you know history, because this is where this way. Sorry. Oh, Mark wants to go to this one. Sorry, I'll I'll, I'll stop right here. Yeah, I just wanted to to briefly have you look at this. This is a. These pictures are done on what's called porcelain enamel. And many of them used to be created right here in the Oak Park area. But um, to me, this is one of the most visually gorgeous pieces. Um, and there are like over 80 John's family members in the cemetery. There's a whole group on the other side of the, the river. There are groups of Druids buried here. I don't know if any of you have family members who are uh, Druids, um, but uh, a lot of rich history. Okay, come. So as I was talking about dancing on the grave, who said, I don't want to be, a, if I can't dance, I don't want to be a part of your revolution? Emma Goldman? Emma Goldman. I heard one say it. Emma Goldman. Well, of course, she's here too. Why wouldn't she be? Probably one of the most important <laughs> me, women in American history that nobody knows, even though she is. It's the Emma Goldman monument. So it's true. However, we will uh, continue on the Haymarket journey because I told you that uh, uh, that the, I, we already talked about how the threat to the, our way of life, that is the need to work 14, 16 hours a day so that your boss could make billions of dollars off of whatever you did, whatever you made. And at that time, most of the work in factories was industrial production. It wasn't uh, intermodal uh, warehousing. It was making things, and it was the building of America. And in many ways, even though we always say it wasn't until 1935 when the National Labor Relations Act was passed and workers got the official legal right to collect the bargaining and built the middle class, 
That middle class is being built because the end of wage slavery and the fight for an eight-hour day, the fight for safe workplaces, the fight to have a voice on the job. Everything that any of you talk about at the table or in organizing new workers, it was the same fight. So we have to rediscover it every single day. And I wish that on this tour we could point out all the people that are in that book that Mark Rogovin has uh, continued to do research and work with others to find why do so many people around the world come here? Why is this the most sacred labor site in the entire world where you're walking right now to see a monument that was dedicated in June of 1893 and the day later the only good governor this state ever had or <laughs> if this is on recording somebody might argue with me but I believe that was a monument dedicated because of Lucy Parsons and the Pioneer Aid Support Association that then deeded to the newly formed Illinois Labor History Society in 1971. This, uh, what we call Radical Row, was of people who died back in the 1880s up to people who died months ago, some with ashes, as I mentioned before. Right here is one of the earlier, uh, it's not one of the earlier, one of the most unique graves uh, here. His name is Eddie Belchaus. I mean, we could speak for 10 minutes alone on Eddie. Very, very well-known character, radical in the Chicago area, good friend of Studs Terkel. And if you read the piece, the artist, poet, rock on tour, one-armed pianist, veteran of the Spanish Civil War. So what's happening is that these graves are telling us about our history. And I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Uh, we are uh, Mark, put it. No, I, I, I just changed the batteries. It's the mic connection. Mark, would you hold it? Or, uh, keep walking. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is why they have edit, editing. Um, it's on, I gotta reset it. What's that symbol? And the tour was tragically cut short. By the way, anybody here ever hear of Leon Trotsky? Yeah. Well, his secretary and probably lover, Raya Dynaviskaya, is right there. See, you know, world history. What event could be as significant as the Russian Revolution and what came after in so many ways in the shaping of our history? Huh. In this cemetery, you'll see, as uh, Mark has written about people and the uh, movement, the activism, the social change that they were invested in. I just want you to see this is the way the monument looked when it was first dedicated. The monument was dedicated in 1893, approximately 1893, and there are these 43 posts surrounded the monument. It's gorgeous, gorgeous thing. And we don't know why in the 1950s they disappeared. But that's that's their history. We don't know. Really now about this will be the Get a little bit closer. 
sir, there'll be time if you're taking photos. But I just want to make sure that those who uh, uh, want to run back to the bus get a feel and a sense and share together in solidarity a couple of matters. Um, you'll notice uh, things are here. Uh, ephemera, flowers all the time. People are always coming here to celebrate uh, the martyrs of Haymarket. And of course, there were eight men who were convicted for no reason other than their ideas. And I'll tell you why we know that, because all you got to do is look at the written record. The written record, the truth of those who were eyewitnesses that was recorded, know that this was a pretext to try to crush the labor movement. And all you got to do is listen to the state's attorney at that quick trial where there was no evidence that he said to the jurors, the 12 of you white men, to six German-born, one ex-Confederate soldier married to a black woman, and a guy born in England who was a lay preacher, Samuel Field, and the last speaker of the night who said, when Inspector Bonfield goes, I command you in the name of the people to disperse, Samuel Field and said, but this is a peaceable meeting. And that's when the unknown person threw the bomb and exploded and was the pretext to crush the burgeoning labor movement in America and then the rest of the world. But State's Attorney Grinnell said to the jury, these men are no more guilty than the rest of you. But convict them for our ideas and keep our society safe. That's in the record. I'm not making this up. That's what this was about, the ideas. So, November 11th, after all the appeals had expired and five of them were to be hanged, but one died the night before in prison, Louis Ling, probably killed by the police, even though the history books try to say that he committed suicide. They had the hoods put over them, and before they were tortured and strangled, they were not hanged to death immediately, breaking their neck. And anybody that knows history about how you lynch somebody as you break the neck or how you hang people, I know it's gruesome and macabre, but you break their neck and they die instantly. They put the hood around them and they march them out to 400 people who are what rich and because they were invited to see the death of the labor movement. And August Spies, a great orator, a great activist, writer of the German language newspaper, the Arbiter Zeitung, he said the day will come when our silence will be greater than the voices you are throttling today. And Albert Parsons said, the day, what did Albert Parsons say? Who knows? <laughs> I say this all the time. Let the voice of the people be heard. Let the voice of the people be heard. And then they were strangled to death hide it so you torture them and show the rest of the world that you can torture people who are trying to change society. I bet you don't read about that very much, but we know that's a fact. Okay, the monument. Lucy Parsons in 1887 didn't want a monument at the time, although they were buried right here where you're standing. But when they decided to celebrate the Chicago police for those who died, unfortunately and tragically, by the bomb throwing, the industrialists had a statue for the police, so Lucy said, we should have a pioneer aid society that helps the widows, the orphans, the family members, and eventually we'll have a statue. And the short story is, and we'll see Lucy in a moment, who's over there, Thousands of people came to the funeral and thousands more came to the dedication in June of 1893 when this great bronze statue that was uh, rededicated in 2011, we raised the money. Mark helped so much and our uh, conservator is actually across the street, ironically, and uh, had this redone. And as the steward of this monument, the Illinois Labor History Society, has an event every year on May 1st at Haymarket Square. 
and people from all over the world. Obviously, we've had some uh, Polish uh, folks be here and perhaps Canadian, uh, I would assume, <laughs> and many others, and there will always be, as long as we have this monument, as long as you support this. But at this time, what I'd like to do, and then we'll say a few more things about this and visit Emma and a couple others, and then head back, is to think about our role. If history is just for what happened in the past and doesn't mean anything, then I wouldn't be doing this. It'd just be like uh, a hobby, I guess. But when I think about the Colombians who came to Haymarket for our first celebration, and I think about the Iraqis, and I think about the Japanese, and I think about the New Zealanders, and last year, the French, and this year, the Swedes, because it's the 100th anniversary of the death of Joe Hill, or the execution. I think about these things and hope you do too. So those of you who have a flower, uh, I would like you to come up and actually lay the flower on the ground because what we do know is that the, conser the conservator has told us that live and plant material, organic material, is bad for the monument, so now we put it on the ground. And so when we think about August Bees and Albert Parsons and Michael Schwab and Samuel Fielden and Louis Ling and uh, George Engel and Adolf Fisher, Let's take a moment as our sisters and brothers lay flowers at the base of this statue. Think about the taxi driver who works 12 hours to make 8 hours of pay. Think about the warehouse worker whose wages are stolen every day. Think about the trades who can be, were just 30 to 40% unemployed a couple of years ago. Think about those who work in hospitals and those around the world that make our clothes, that if they were just paid one dollar, if we paid one dollar more for anything we wear and was given to those workers in Honduras and Guatemala and Bangladesh and Haiti and Vietnam, if we paid one dollar more and the company didn't get it, those people would be able to eat well for a month if it went to them. So that's what this is about. So let's also celebrate in a positive way that that's why we do this. Because it improves the quality of life. And Lucy Parsons, who is over here, she led her whole life doing this until she died in a tragic house fire in Chicago. And Irving Abrams, who carried on, the last surviving member of the Pioneer Aid Society who deeded this monument. And in a moment, we'll come around the back, but Mark probably has a couple of more things that he would like to tell us about the monument. And then we'll go around back and look at what Altfeld did when he pardoned those who were still alive and in jail. In the uh, in the early 1980s, the laurel wreaths were stolen, probably for the value of the bronze. And really, once that happened, myself and others started to get uptight about any of the other things Did that you could just be damaged. Did you see the the value of this, not financially, but terms of the heart is so incredible. Come around back. And as we're walking around back, I just want to say something about the statue that you see, this woman, uh, based on the story, really, of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The French, the Marseillais was sung as they came out to be hanged. They came out to be hanged. They sang the Marseillais. The French story, the song of the French Revolution, and that's in part what inspired the artist's vision, looking to the east of the new day with her pulling out her sword ready to fight for a new day, to defend the worker who has fallen. And you'll see as you go back around the hand over the fallen worker. Uh, the day after <clears throat> the 1893 dedication of the monument, Governor Altgeld 
freed the last three of the martyrs. They were imprisoned in Joliet, which is just an hour and a half ride from Chicago. And this bronze piece, we don't know when it was installed. You know, we all think it was part of this monument, but it wasn't. Uh, it was, you know, obviously at some point, probably within a year uh, after the three men were, were freed, this gorgeous piece was, was put up. And it states near the top that it was, that these men were freed because the trial was not fair. And Altgeld gives an absolute pardon to Samuel Fielden, Oscar Nevy, and Michael Schwab. These names were already here. And those three names were here. We have no idea when this went missing. But the Labor History Society, among 50 other things. Uh, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is one of the things on what's called the Larry List. <laughs> uh, this will be one of the things on the Larry List, and we will event finally have these names back up for people to understand. Now, I want to tell people something that has never, ever, ever been made public. Under here, right under this section here, is buried a time capsule. It is, if, if everything goes right, within the next month or two, there will be a film made that will be shown at the end of 2015. There were over 2,000 people who came to the dedication of this burial six months before the monument was completed. Um, I have something brief to read. I'm cutting it back to six pages. Um, the president of the Cigar Makers Union said, My friends, you have no right to murmur against the, pe the police, the club, or the pistol as long as you walk to the polls to vote. If the working people had understood their position, we would not be called out to dedicate this monument, which is about to be erected. When generations to come dig up these records and read them, they will wonder that such barbarity could have been tolerated in the 19th century. None of us have ever heard that. Have you ever heard that, Larry? This is the first time. This is the first time. And, and up in this container, unless it was taken out at some point, there are newspapers from the uh, progressive movement, from the newspapers, from unions from across the U.S. There is a death mask of one of the martyrs. That was a common thing that people did in the beginning of the 20th century and, and earlier. If it really happens, this is going to be an amazing phenomenon. And it will be ours. It will be the radical movement forever. And if all ha happens, we will have it on display the same building, strangely enough, that houses the Illinois Labor History Society, Roosevelt University, right off of Michigan Avenue downtown. And nobody knows about that. We haven't been spreading that around because we don't want people to come here and start like chiseling away. <laughs> so, that, that, I mean, but it is, if, it, if we find things, it's going to be made into a documentary and you'll be able to see it on TV. Um, one other thing is that we always keep one flower back um, to put on Lucy's uh, grave. And today I was asked by the radio hour show who 
was one of my who was my favorite labor person? And I was like, that's a ridiculous question. How could I possibly answer that? But I did. I ended up saying Lucy Parsons because she's an incredible story. When she, when she found out, you know, when her husband was arrested and she she went around and she was trying to get people to help her, you know, save his life. And when she realized it wasn't going to happen and that he was going to die, she rushed back to the prison and she wanted all she wanted to do was say goodbye. Everybody always said that they had this amazing love. And you know how organizers are. Like, my fiance is an organizer. That's the best kind of romance there is, right? Like, you're in the trenches together. And, and, and they had gone all over Chicago and had been giving speeches and writing and living their life for this. And she knew he was going to die. And all she wanted to do was see him. And what they did is they strip searched her and put her and her children in a cell and didn't let her see them until he was dead. And, 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 she, and she never got to say goodbye. So I always like to keep a flower for her. Because I don't know if that was me, I think I'd be bitter and I would like go live in my apartment somewhere and that'd be it, I'd be done with the movement. But instead she redoubled her efforts and she fought and, and she was the person that was in front in 1915 um, of the march um, with, along with Jane Addams where the first time ever the song Solidar Solidarity Forever was sung in Chicago. And, like, and she dedicated her entire life to her husband's memory and to the fight for working people. So uh, we left one sister with a rose, so if you want to put it on Lucy's grave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to, um, as we uh, head over just for a very quick view of Emma, um, some wonder, well, how did Altgeld, who happened to be born in Germany, and couldn't run again after the pardon because he was basically blacklisted by the uh, industrialist class, the business class, the owners, the bosses. But he was a great governor for many reasons. He chose not to intervene in Pullman. But it was Clarence Darrow, the lawyer, who many of you heard about, who became the greatest labor lawyer in America because he defended Eugene Debs, who everybody should know. Raise your hand if you know the story of Eugene Debs. Oh, at least two of you. See, you paid attention. Uh, but uh, he defended Debs in the Pullman trial, which was basically to take, uh, make Debs as if he was uh, the uh, uh, violator of the antitrust laws, when in fact it was the monopolists, uh, the Pullman and the railroad owners and the steel owners. But um, it was a... Uh, man who, when Altgeld got elected and worked for the railroad up to that point, went to Darrow, or went to Deb, and Darrow says, you need to look at that Haymarket case. That was unfair. And Altgeld looks at it, a student of Lincoln, uh, who, uh, Altgeld was, wrote uh, about Lincoln, believed in Lincoln's ideals, and he said, I do have to issue a pardon. So, we continue our fight. Emma yeah. Goldman, the date's wrong of her death. Mark, it says 1939, but it was not 39, was it? Who knows? Albert, uh, our friend Irving Abrams, though, took care of this, uh, which is why the Labor History Society is in the process of continuing to take care of it. But Emma Goldman, a great radical uh, suffragette, uh, really way ahead of her time, born in Russia and was deported like almost every labor activist who wasn't born in America during World War I, that is, deported because they opposed the war, which almost any good American would have in World War I. It was not a fight against fascism. It was a fight to divide up the world for profit, and everybody sort of knows that today. Our president was against World War I initially, so it was unpopular. But that being the case, Emma, before she was deported, along with Ben Reitman, Dr. Ben Reitman, who is here. Uh, uh, they spoke all over the country, and so many people come here to see Emma. Um, and it looks like some of our Polish friends came here as well. Uh, Mark, would you say a little bit about just a few of the others in the uh, uh, radical row here? A couple of the more Thank significant uh, people in our history that we should have known. Uh, well, <laughs> this group here uh, are members of the Communist Party, and uh, all the way from workers in steel mills to dining, William Patterson, and I mean, you know, if 
if I ask, has anyone ever heard of this name, William Patterson? Scottsboro Boys. How many people have heard of the Scottsboro Boys? And this is an incredible case of uh, uh, nine youth who were afraid uh, for raping a, a, a white man. And he was involved in the case also of uh, the two uh, the two fishermen. Sacco and Vanzetti. That's an incredible case that, that you all should know. And Stephanie. Yes. Tell us a little bit about Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is obviously one of the most important women, right, in the labor movement. And the song, The Rebel Girl, right, that that is that Joe Hill wrote is was for her. And so it even says on it, the, the Rebel Girl, um, fighter for working class emancipation. And, and like Larry said, um, she, I, she's one of those people that you just don't hear about in, in U.S. history. But uh, most labor people who study history heard of Bread and Roses. Yeah. The Bread and oh, Roses sorry. strike. Yeah. One of the leaders of that strike and an IWW member, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Mark, I do believe that we have to get yes. on the bus That's because, <laughs> you know, this bus is the uh, gonna keep moving, uh, keep us uh, oh, yeah, see sure. a few more sites. Yeah. Who, who needs more uh, 